There we go. Okay. Got a new uh, lavalier microphone, so I don't know. <laughs> Trying to figure it out. Make sure the power, but power button's on and everything's ready to go. If you would, get a Bible and open up to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to start our continuing our lesson of the book of Hebrews. So as you, you turn there, um, let's get a little bit of background and keep this flow going because too often we've taken portions of the Bible and we extract some great lessons, but we lose the, I think, the context of the whole uh, book. This is a letter. This is a letter that somebody wrote to people. He had an idea behind why he's writing it. He had a reason. He had a target audience. And, and so we have to keep that in mind. And when you sit down and pin a letter or write an email or even put a text together to send it, you already have a basic idea of who am I writing to? Why am I sending this? And what are they going to be thinking when they read it? And we, every correspondent that we type, text, email, that's kind of a process. Well, these written letters are no different. So the letter is written to Hebrews. Pretty plain, you'd say, well, you know, to the Hebrews. Well, who were the Hebrews? Well, they were also called Jews. They were the descendants of Abraham. They were the descendants of the promise that had been given to Abraham, passed down through generations, became a great and mighty nation that also you've heard called Israel. This nation, Israel, then brought forward the, the Son of God, brought the promises, and all that we see as Jesus lived, died, buried, resurrected, and then we see the gospel message starting on the day of Pentecost. And from there, the primary uh, race of the church, of those converted, were who? They were, they were Hebrews. They were Jews. And then from there, then it spread out. It went out to, out to Canaan. And then from Canaan, it went out to Asia Minor and throughout the whole world. So then the church started going from a Jewish Christian church to a Christian, Jewish, and Gentile, or non-Jewish people. The Hebrews had a very good knowledge of what the Old Testament spoke about through the prophets and through the Psalms. And so they had lived it. It was a theocracy. It wasn't like America where we have our religion separate from our government. If you knew the government, you knew the religion. If you knew the religion, you knew the government. That's the way that the Hebrews were brought up. Nothing that they did was without the Mosaic law. So their whole life was regulated by everything was regulated around the Mosaic law. And in that same way, the message was being taught about this Messiah. Now, these readers are those who have already accepted the idea that the Messiah was this man, this man named Jesus. We're not at that point. So the, these are Christians. They've been established for a while. You can tell by the way he's writing. This is not brand new stuff to these people who read it. But there's a problem. That's why you write certain letters, right? You want to communicate a concept. So one of the problems that they're having is that they're starting to, under fear of persecution, they've already experienced one. Chapter 10, we're going to look at the idea that they had suffered through once and came out very strong. But now they're starting to waver. And what do you do if you, uh, you're going to fall back or go another direction spiritually? you're probably going to go back to what you grew up with, what you're very familiar with. Now, to the Hebrew, they lost everything. They lost their government. They lost their heritage, everything. Their families would completely abandon them. I mean, their, their retirement for a Hebrew was the family. Not, not, not like today where you'd file for, you know, they couldn't file Social Security with the government of Israel and see if they were going to get it back then. It was the family. So they gave everything up. And they're very comfortable religiously with the Mosaic Law. And now, after they've been a Christian for a while and they've had this growth and maturity, this persecution has hit them. And the weight of it has started to impact the quality of their life, causing a lot of misery among family already, and it's wearing them down. So the writer starts out by reminding them of the greatness of Jesus, of the fact that he's superior to everything you can imagine spiritually. Starting out from that he was a part of the creation that created things. He also was one that was greater than angels. He's greater than the prophets because God now uses him to speak through. There's no more prophets. In various times, various ways, God used to speak to our fathers, he said. Very first verse. But now God speaks through who? So he starts out by right away reminding them, if you want to talk to God, you want to listen from God, 
you can't go listen to Amos. You can't go and listen to Isaiah. You have to listen to Jesus. And so that, that was a weightful one, one that just kind of carried right through there. And so he progresses through these chapters up to the point where we're going to get to in five. And, and he builds this idea of superiority. But what's really exciting is now, you know, as a Hebrew, if you're reading this letter, you know that there was actually kind of this concept of two messiahs. And it was kind of neat in class this morning. If you're watching the video, Kyle Butts brought that up. They actually thought, because they could not reconcile the idea that, one, that this would be a suffering son of God, that this would be the king. And there actually, there was another problem that they just left completely out that in our class this morning with Kyle Butts was the idea that he was a priest. They knew the law regulated very clearly that you could not be a priest unless you were from the tribe of Levi. That's the only place priests come from. They understood that the king was going to be from Judah. Okay, check. This man, Jesus, was from the tribe of Judah. But he starts bringing up this idea that the priesthood, the priesthood was Jesus, Jesus. And then he brings up this wonderful a verse that they're also very familiar with because they knew the Psalms. And the Psalms talked about Melchizedek. And again, these were some of the little pieces of the puzzle that they couldn't quite pull together. It took them a while to try to pull it together because they're like, eh, how do you bring a suffering Messiah, a king, and a priest all into one person? And that's what he has to do with this letter is to remind them. You know, I mean, superficially, you could accept Jesus as your Lord and your Savior and all those things, but there's some aspects to it that people still struggle with. And so when you're weak and you're not growing, you'll fall, you'll start to stumble, you'll start to lose your focus. And so he reminds them, don't drift, because that's the problem that they were having. They were starting to drift away, slowly away, and it's a slow process. There's no, no Christian wakes up one morning and said, that's it, I'm done with it. I'm not going to church anymore. I'm done. I don't believe in God. No, they won't even say that, will they? It's slow. Something happens, they become a little spiritually depressed, and then all of a sudden they'll come up with an excuse and not start to go to church for a couple of Sundays, and it becomes very comfortable because nobody said anything, right? And so one Sunday turns to five and turns to a couple of months, and then all of a sudden, they, they, if you called them up and said, did you quit being a Christian, what would they say? No, I'm still a Christian. You are? Did you not see that drift that you took? No, I didn't drift. Yeah, you did. So he warns them of the same process that we experience as well. Be careful. And then he talks about, he, he comes back to Jesus, builds this idea of the priesthood, and then all of a sudden he, he like faints over, and then he says, he's greater than even Joshua. What? What is Joshua? Okay, Moses, so that means he trumps everybody else. But see, Joshua was to bring them into the land of Canaan, which was to be a rest. He said they missed that one too. They missed the rest. And he talks about the idea that it's not just a singular rest, a one-time event of rest, rest, but it was something that was to come. Why, he says, he reminds them, why did, did the prophets continually remind them that there's another rest, a bigger rest, a better rest that's coming up? And he said, don't fail to do it just like we saw our fathers do. Our fathers fell to into that rest, didn't they? And then he talks about the Word of God. He says, that Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Man, that Word of God can expose and come and just whittle you to pieces and expose every part of you, who you are before God. You cannot hide from the Word of God. So if you're going to fail to enter the rest, if you think you can drift away, remember the Word of God is something you cannot escape. Now at this point, if you're listening to this letter, you're going, oh, oh. I am pretty worthless. I, I am not. I, I, am, I feel so exposed. And then he comes back. You see, the Jew also understood the importance of having a priest. Not for just ceremonies, but the concept behind what a priest was. 
Today, we don't like that. If you're not Catholic or you're not some organization, church organization that has priests, you know, you look at that and, you know, we kind of shied away from that, that concept. But the point started really historically in our relationship with God from the moment that we sin. And we were put apart from God and we could no longer walk with God. And right away, what do we find? We find two brothers offering a sacrifice. What? Where'd that come from? Where did that come from? There's a problem. And they were instructed on how to sacrifice. They became the priest that was taking a sacrifice and offering it. Then we find as we go through Genesis that there's a patriarchal, a head of family that starts to offer these sacrifices as such. And they're a personal priest for the family. Job talks about offering sacrifices for his whole family. They were under what they would call the patriarchal blood that was serving for his entire family. Then we find Abraham comes along. He is also offering sacrifice. We see it's still something very important that even Abraham understood that I cannot be in the presence of God. There's a problem. And so then all of a sudden we find that then it's very specific. When Moses comes along and the Israelite is formed as a nation on Mount Sinai, then God becomes very literal. And he says, this is the way it's going to be formally. And he establishes a method that would be a shadow of the real thing. Kind of like if you walk out right now and you look at your car, you might have a shadow. And you say, yeah, look, I can recognize the fender, but it's not, that, that's not your car, is it? That's what the old law was. That's what the temple, the tabernacle, all that was about. The priesthood was just a shadow. It's not the thing you want. Why would you continue to ride a second-rate item when you have the best? And that now is his challenge, is to try to bring, you got the king, we got that he had to suffer and die and be buried and raised, but the Hebrew writer listening to this is going, but this priesthood, this priesthood is something I'm going to struggle with. I know I need it, I get that concept, but it can't be him because the prophets and all that doesn't, doesn't permit it. And so he goes through it, and he explains it, and he brings up again Melchizedek. And what I find here is very similar to what every one of us experienced when we try to talk to somebody, and finally that you can just look at them, and you can look them in the eye, and you can tell they're like... Or they're... Oh, no, I'm listening. Go ahead. Keep talking. What? What was that? And I can just almost feel the writer as he's progressing through this, that he's starting to bring out one of the most important things to a Hebrew was the priesthood. How do you get right with God? The priest. And he catches you dozing off. And all of a sudden he stops. And he says, you know, I have a lot to say about this. There's some amazing things. And I know you understand that this is important, but something's happened. He says, you have grown dull of hearing. How can I explain it when you're looking at your phone all the time? Oh, okay, they didn't have phones. How can I talk to you when you're so distracted with everything else in this world that you're not paying attention? You've grown dull to listening to God's word. And so it's like you can almost see, almost like you're sitting there watching. The Hebrew writer's watching. He's talking to somebody, and they start to doze off. And he goes, oh, there's so many cool things. i got to talk to you about this Melchizedek, and you just dozed on me. And there's a problem. You see, he knew, because the Holy Spirit is guiding him in his pinning of this letter, that there's a problem with that because, one, they should have already been teaching themselves. Now, this is written to all of them. So you said, well, wait a minute, not all you should be teachers. Isn't that what James said? Yeah, but all of you should be able to at least teach the gospel. Should be able to talk about salvation. And some of them absolutely should have been teaching and bringing that forward. And he said, because of that fact, you know what? We got to start all over again. And how can I go into something so complex about Melchizedek? Because he's not even a Jew. He's not even Hebrew. And he's a historical person that just blip up in his story and disappears, pops into a psalm here. This prophet, that if you don't understand the fundamentals, I cannot go on. 
And there's a problem because even though you may not be able to comprehend the totality of what I'm trying to say about a priesthood, but that means, guess what? You're missing the basic things, the very fundamental things. Sometimes the reason we're not able to comprehend some, some concepts is because we're, we're missing a foundation. I have seen so many Christians who will sit and spend so much time working out the book of Revelations, and they don't even understand what agape is. Yeah. Agape. Oh, I love, man. It feels good. No, that isn't agape. But they're stumbling through the book of Revelations, trying to figure out when the end time, when this is going on, what that's going on, when, when they haven't even grasped the foundations of it. You see, because it takes a lot of the foundation in order to progress forward. You don't go from 2 plus 2 to trigonometry. Now, some of you might be able to. <laughs> I'll never will. But you don't do that. And he says, you're missing that progress. There's a danger. And this is, again, is where a lot of false doctrines and teachings come from today about the book of Revelation and other prophets. Because they haven't got the foundational understanding, and they're jumping off. And they're starting to go to these other areas, and they're starting to build this other thoughts and these theories, and they're buying into them. Now, this is very applicable to what the Hebrew writer is going to say here. So I need you to listen to that. Just like some Christians today who don't understand the basic concept of baptism, the resurrection, grace, faith, but they jump out and start grabbing on to man-made theology and thoughts and theories and conspiracy stories and all these great monstrous stories coming out of Revelation, they buy it. They buy it. This is a problem that is not new. And so he reminds them of the process of milk versus meat. It's almost like they need meat, milk, and all of a sudden he hands them a piece of meat. Would you hand a piece of meat to a baby that has no teeth? What would happen? I think everybody here would know. Even if you don't have children, hand a piece of meat to a spiritual baby that can only process milk and they will choke spiritually. Now that's important to understand as we continue to go through here because there's a very hard passage that people have stumbled over because they don't even understand the principles of what he's understanding to them and trying to explain to them. They get caught up in this and they focus in on something they've grabbed onto. And I know I'm, 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 I'm leaving a little vague for you because this has been a challenge for a lot of people. But one of the processes that is also very beneficial, and this is an important step too, is it helps you to be able to know truth from false. What's true, what's false. What's good, what's evil. And again, because of a lot of Christians who have not grown into maturity, they're quabbling over things that are ridiculous. They really are. It's like, you, you know what Romans 14 is? Do you, do you know what Paul taught about these other concepts and dealing with conflict? Because, buddy, you're not showing it. You're fighting over something that is ridiculous. Oh, I can't really even talk to you about that because you don't understand that part either. But you'll fight over it. So I can really feel the passion of the Hebrew writer trying to just stop for a moment and give them this incredible warning. Now, he flows it back. I mean, he's not going to keep it just totally depressing, but it's something that is important that if you're going to move forward in this conversation with me, he says, then you have to be able to understand the difference between good and evil. And everybody goes, well, I know what that is. Spiritually, though. And, and is it relative to your definition of good and evil? Or is it relative to God's definition of good and evil? So let's jump to chapter 6, verse 1, and read. We're going to read 1 through 3. And I also have it up on the screen. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of, of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. And this will do if God permits. Do you know what those mean? Look, 
just look. I mean, you know, when we look at this, I remember even, you know, when I first was reading this, I would look at some of the way he's even phrased this, and I'd go, oh, uh, no, I, that's basic, that's fundamental. It really is. It's, again, it's kind of a language barrier, generational. Repentance from dead works to a Hebrew. What is works? What is works to a Hebrew? It's all the system of Mosaic law, in a nutshell. And that was dead. That's gone. Things that are not. You're not going to be saved by works. You're saved by faith. And then that's why he then says faith towards God. To you and I, that sounds very simple. But again, faith versus works, again, is a foundational concept that the, the Hebrews need to understand, be able to distinguish. Instruction about washing. You know, again, the Hebrew knew about ceremonial cleansing. They knew the importance of that they had to be clean. You know, they had all these ceremonial pools of water where they would, before they would even go up to the temple, that they would go and submerge themselves into that to become ceremonial clean before they would even go to the temple. They understood it. John the Baptist, that's why when John the Baptist showed up, that he was baptizing them unto repentance. And they got it, and they went out there by the thousands, didn't they? They understood the concept of being clean before God. And then, of course, we have the idea of the Holy Spirit baptism. That's another immersion. Immersion of water. Immersion of spiritual cleanliness to be before God. And then the day of Pentecost. Peter stood up and said, unless you are immersed for forgiveness of sin, baptized for forgiveness of sin, so they understand, okay, there's another type of an immersion, a washing. And even today, I have people question about, and then we'll start discussing the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I almost feel like I'm throwing chunks of meat at a baby with no teeth. And I don't want to talk about it with them because they're going to choke. Because there's so much foundational things around it that I have to back up and say, well, okay, we got to go way back and start discussing this. So you see what he's talking about? To, to them, they've already known these things. These are, these are conversations they've had, that they've accepted. The laying on of hands. Customarily, it was a way of showing my approval. If I walked up to my oldest son and put my hands on him and did something, we understand that culturally it was a way of identifying. But it also was something more because it was the way we find that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were passed. So who can get the hands laid on? Why is so-and-so getting their hands laid on? You know, going all the way back to that, we saw Simon the, the magician, remember him? He wanted, he wanted not only the hands laid on him, but he wanted a power that the apostles had to be able to give that power out. So you can see where, again, that was something that they needed to do. And, he, and these are foundational topics. He goes, we got to go on. We can't stick around on this topic. Resurrection of the dead. Have you been taught anything outside of the resurrection of the dead other than Jesus Christ was you know, crucified, buried, and raised, and ascended to heaven? That, that's really, I know that's all I grew up with, was that type of a resurrection. And the concept that, you know, that okay, that's the way you take something that's dead, buried, raised, comes to life, and goes. And then that, I can share in part of that. They, the Hebrews did not have that real clarity to it. Again, they had shadows. So they needed to understand what resurrection is. Even today, I ran across somebody who told me they did not believe. They believed Jesus. They believed supernatural. They believed in God, all these things. He did miracles and all that, but said, you know what? That resurrection, I don't believe in. I was like, and I, no, no qualifications, just period. So I can understand that, that that is something too. Eternal judgment, what does that mean? Well, there's man's judgment. And there's one that's eternal from God. And what does that mean? He says that's what we have discussed. And if we have time, we'll come and discuss it again. The Lord willing, as we would say today, as my grandma would say, Lord willing, you know, we'll, we'll come back to that. But we have other things we've got to move on to. Now, this is where, because of throwing meat to babies... And then those babies listening to people with other doctrines already established within themselves. This has become one of the most disturbing scriptures to a lot of Christians. So let's read, starting in verse 4. 
For it is impossible in the case of those who have once tasted who once have been enlightened, who have tasted this heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God unto their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. For the land has drunk the rain, for the land that has drunk the rain that falls on it and produces a crop useful to those who sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. So the very controversial concept is, is it possible to not be able to receive repentance? And, and if, you, if you've been a Christian a while, you automatically go, isn't that what it's about? I mean, even John the Baptist, when he started it, he was baptizing for them unto repentance back to Mosaic law. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness. That's what, you know, Peter said in the book of Acts. He said, repent and be baptized. If you don't repent, they're connected, even in the Greek structure. If there's no repentance, there's no need to be baptized because why are you doing it for? There has to be repentance. So when he says it, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, it's impossible. This is where what I've been talking about in setting, in, setting up, context, 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 yeah, con, well, you're getting tired of me saying it. Context, context, context. Always remember what's he been talking about. Don't jump into a middle of a... You've had that happen, haven't you? I used to have it with my kids. I'd be talking to my wife, you know, Suzanne, and sitting there talking, and one of my boys would walk in, and they'd go, what are you talking about, the blue car? What? You just jumped in and heard blue car and then wanted to know all about a blue car. You don't know the context. You don't know the conversation. Ah, see, that's what we do as Christians, don't we? We jump in and we'll go one verse and there it is. It's like you forgot what he, who he's talking to, what he's been discussing, and how did he come to this point. And so if you just take this one, it's horrible. It's, it's, it, it's frightening you think about this. You know, the other one that is closely related to that is blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. That's another one that I feel like sometimes I'm chunking meat at a baby with no teeth. Because again, context. If you don't back up and explain a whole lot of stuff around it, and then they go, ah, oh, that makes sense now. But what did they do? Blaspheme of the Holy Spirit? Oh, no, I can't, I can't be forgiven of that? That's the only sin that... Can I, hold on there. Hold on. Take a breath. And we had to go back and place it into what? Context. So that's what we have to do with this verse. We have to be able to bring it into a context. What's he been talking about? He started about the superiority of Christ. He's been showing them how great he is. Then he's bringing in these warnings and showing how they can drift away. He's doing all these things. So we got to break this down, and I'll bring in the context with it as we go along. So what is the problem, he says? Impossible to restore them to repentance. It says what it says. It means what it means. Don't try to work around it. Because I watched a ton of YouTube from all different varieties of religion, and I was out hiking Friday, and I was listening to one, and I almost stumbled and broke my leg. I was just like, what? Did you? I backed it up and listened to it again, and I, I got my phone, and I'm looking at the scripture. I'm going, how did you get that? I must be really dumb. And then the more I listen to him, he's talking in circles. He's, he, he just, and, and then I realized he's an Armenius. Do you even know what that is? An Arminianist? I hope you don't have to worry about that. But you see, a Calvinist and an Arminianist are people who look at destiny, predestined. 
They're the same. Calvin, they believe that God knows who you are and he's going to have you saved and already before the foundations of the earth and then irresistible grace is at some point in your life going to strike you and then you will have faith and you'll be regenerated and you'll be saved. But he already knows. And the rest of you, well, sorry. <laughs> That's God's sovereignty. He can choose who he wants. The Arminianist believes he knows exactly you. He's already predestined. So it's the same thing. And I'm, I don't have time to go off on all the different aspects. But once I understood kind of what they were teaching, then all of a sudden I listened to him again and I'm going, so you're really not even coming to this passage without already some preconceived ideas. And you know what? I become frightened for me. Because here I am judging him and I caught myself going, hold on, Ron. <laughs> How quick you are. What am I bringing? To prejudice this. And I think that's what we have to remember. Is what are we bringing that would cause this to become difficult? See, I've never had a problem with this. This is never, until I started learning more about predestiny and tulip and Calvinism and Arminianism and all that, it didn't come at all. I, I just couldn't get it. I was like, because all I ever did was read the scripture and listen to people that were reading the scripture, correlate it with other concepts in the scripture, Never read anything from a person just in the scripture, and I never saw it this way. But it's there. And if you had that gut check when I was reading that to you, it's probably because you need to move a little more towards maturing. Because they're going to bring this up. This is a very difficult passage for those who believe in predestiny to get around. And they'll do it by certain things that they will say. They'll say, first off, you know, who are they? Who are these people? Who do you think they are? Just gut answer. If I was to say, raise a hand, I'd give you some options here. I think that 99% of you would say what? They're Christians. Why would you do that? Why would you think that? Because the people who are reading it are Hebrewish Christians. Key word. Christians. It says they've been enlightened. He says that they've tasted the heavenly gift. Now that word taste there, we need to focus on as well because that's a word they've changed around because of having to, under, to explain predestiny. So you enjoy a part. Being enlightened is the word of God, the plan of salvation. When they became a Christian, they went from darkness to light, didn't they? They were brought out of that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the light. I, everybody come to me, gets to the Father. That's a part of this totality of enlightenment. The gospel was enlightenment. Heavenly gift. Jesus told the woman at the Samaritan well that it was the heavenly gift that was going to ultimately be brought to them. And I'm paraphrasing pretty horribly just for kind of time's sake. But it's something, in other words, of dealing with salvation. Shared in the Holy Spirit. What did... The apostle Peter tell the crowd in Acts 2.38, he said, Be baptized, each one of you, for forgiveness of your sins, and this promise, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness and Holy Spirit there. Now I just saw a bunch of you go off in left field. Because now we start to discuss uh, different aspects of the Holy Spirit, right? Let's don't go down that route yet. We don't have enough time. But obviously it's a concept here that we can see that he's saying. They shared in the Holy Spirit. They had it. They tasted the goodness of God's word. They've lived it. These are, these are not your babies. These are people that are very mature Christians who have come along. And this one tasted of the powers of the age to come. You know, I, I thought about it, and this is what's so amazing. You think about the miracles that Jesus performed and you look at the power that he had to overcome physics, walking on water, taking the dead and bringing them back to regenerate into life. All those wonderful things. That's just the taste of it. Just the taste of it. Because what God has for us in plan, all the power and the wonderful things we see is just the taste. 
but you, it's real. When these people who had the gifts of the Holy Spirit were raising people from the dead, that was real. When you were able to give a man his sight back as the apostles and other disciples who had been imparted with those gifts, they were real. But he said, just a taste of the ages to come. Because when we're regenerated with Christ in the end, that's going to be the full flavor, the full immersion of that. So they've partaken of that. So do these sound like people who were never saved to begin with? I don't see how you can see that in there. I mean, everything about the context, again, these are people who genuinely were Christians. They had, they had full level. If anything, these were mature Christians. What happens is they take that word taste when it comes to predestined. They say, see, they just tasted it. It's kind of like I handed you a little bit of my milkshake and said, Darren, have a sip, and then bring it back. But you really didn't have it. You got a taste of it. Or like my coffee. Give you a little sip of it. But no, you, you really don't get it. That's a stretch. Because now let's go and see how the Hebrew writer uses that word. Isn't that important? You see, I have words, and there's certain ways that I always use certain words. Maybe silly, maybe dumb, whatever, but that's the way Ron uses certain words. Like people in the South, they say they live in a holler. What is a holler? But they will always refer to it, and it'll mean something consistently every time when somebody from the South says a holler. To me, I think they're yelling like I do when I preach. I'm hollering. It's a canyon. So every time, though, when you'd read somebody from the South using the word holler, you would know it didn't mean what you said. So let's look at that word taste. Back over in Hebrews 2.9. But we see him for a little while while he was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and the honor because of the sufferings of death, so that by grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Just a little bit? Not fully dead? The same, go to the Greek, it's exactly the same word he uses when he says, they tasted of the power of the ages to come, when they tasted the heavenly gifts. So to me, they're, they're real. So now, how do you get in that condition? Just like I'm going to keep kind of provoking you with that blaspheme of the Holy Spirit question. And that's what I used to always go, how can I avoid that? How does that happen? How can somebody get to that point, right? Can it still happen? So how do they get there? Well, he's been talking about it. Again, context. He's been building up to it. I mean, going back to chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Look what he says. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest what? We drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. That's pretty harsh. How shall we escape such a great salvation? It was declared first by the Lord, and it was attested by those who heard. While God also bore witness with what? Signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will, passed out among them. This is the same letter. Very clearly, He's, he's, he's bringing it to them and saying, this is what, what has happened. This is what happened. You drifted, you neglected, you fell into this rest. This is what is happening and going on. Now I'm going to jump to chapter 10 because to show you, to kind of bookshelf the idea of what the writer's talking about. We can see there, he says in verse 26 of Hebrews 10, for if we go on deliberately, sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by those who have trampled underfoot the Son of God and who has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified 
and has outraged the spirit of grace. So we're talking about the same audience, the potential that they all still have, and the great danger of what's going on. Why does this happen? Well, you know, one of the things is he's described something I thought was very important. One of the processes and the resultants of this. Now, you and I can't see it, but this is a very powerful part of the answer here. He says, they crucify once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. What does that mean when he says crucify? They crucify him again. Well, here is truth. Here is the Son of God. Here is one who is superior to everything that you can imagine. He's a priest. He's a king. He's done all these great things. And then you turn around and you walk away. You reject. You're, you're basically taking the cross and rejecting it. But it's a little bit further, I think, as he describes it. But we see this same type of an attitude. Again, without digging a tremendous amount of scripture to back this up, but we see in Luke 22, verse 2, what happened? The same type of people that he's talking about that in this letter, the Hebrew writer says, are failing to ever come to repentance were the same ones that were saying, crucify him, crucify him. Some of them were there. Not all of them, though, right? Because we know of the thousands that stood there and was proclaiming that some did come to repentance. But some of them were sitting there looking at God's Son, performing miracles, teaching these wonderful things, and yet did what? You're doing this by the power of the devil. That links into my answer, too, about the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit. A person who reaches this level has taken what they believe they understand as God. They have reshaped the gospel. They've taken parts and bring it, brought it together. And they are very self-righteous. Not even realizing that they have drifted away from that truth and they've substituted it. And that's what the Apostle Paul addresses in the letter of Galatians. In Galatians 6.14... He says, but it far be it from me to boast except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. See the difference here? What does Paul crucify? He crucifies the world. What are these people doing? They're taking everything that's about Jesus and they're crucifying him. Again, just like those who were at the foot of the cross looking right at him, knowing all that he had accomplished. And they never came to repentance, did they? And yet they as well, in a sense, did they not taste and participate and see many wonderful things that he had accomplished before their own eyes? Judas? Was he not one? Look at the difference here. We have Peter, who also failed the Lord on the night that he was betrayed, but he repented. But Judas, oh, he had some form of repentance, but you see, he had a preconceived idea of who the Messiah was, and he was going to force God's hand and get Jesus in front of him so that he could strike him down with his power and go up there and sit in Pilate's throne and take over. That was his theology. You see what he did? He took what he knew. He was there on the boat when he walked on water. He was there at the grave when Lazarus was raised from the dead. But you see, he already had some theology that he was bringing with him. He was one that was struggling with the concept that this cannot be the suffering Messiah. Remember, even Peter himself said, Far be it for you to go to Jerusalem and suffer. Far be it, no. And Jesus rebuked him, and we know he repented. Judas, no. But yet he participated in all those wonderful things of being there with the Lord and Savior. And he went out and hanged himself. But he received the same blessings, didn't he, of all the other apostles. And that's why Paul, in the first part of the book of Galatians, says so boldly in one Verse 6, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ 
and are turning to a different gospel. Which he continues right there and says, but uh, there is no different gospel. There's only one gospel. How quick are you doing that? And then in 5 verse 2, he says that if you add anything to this, then the crucifixion of Christ was for nothing. Look what he says. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, taking a part of the old law, some of your old theology, and bringing it to the cross, he says, Christ is no advantage to you. Drifting away and not being able to discern between good or evil opens you up to accept anything and just build on it and feel so good about your theology. And he's, that, there's no way you'll ever be able to understand the need to come to repentance because repentance can accomplish salvation. John talks about it when he says that any of you who thinks you're not a sinner, you're making God a liar. He says that if you're sinning, then you need to come to him. You need to repent and turn. There's an opportunity. But there's something unique about these people, isn't it? These individuals are a very special case. They're ones who have achieved a level of certain maturity. And I'm kind of speculating a little bit, but I think they're like the scribes and the, the Pharisees that were very legalistic and, and self-righteous. And then when the Christ, the Son of God, the very Word of God was standing before them, they couldn't even see the Word of God for their own personal theology. They couldn't see. How frightening. And so were they ever going to be able to come to repentance? You notice the action's on them. Not God. The action is on them. They are failing to repent. Not God doing it to them. God didn't pick on them at all. And so he then applies this. And this is awesome. I know I'm going a little long today. Look what he says in 7 and 8. For the land that has drunk the rain that it often falls on it, and produces a crop useful to those whose sake it is cultivated, receives the blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near being cursed, and to its end is burned. So, okay, this is a parable. The land are Christians. Look what he says. For the land, there's those in this he's trying to bring to a point of a teaching illustration. I've just said there are some who are not ever going to be able to come to repentance. But he says they're equal. God, again, is giving the same blessings, the same word of God to all. The same land is receiving the same rain. But there's some of that land has taken it and produced, and this is what's cool. Look what he says. A crop useful for those whose sake it was cultivated. God did not cultivate the word of God, what he is doing to produce something for just your benefit. What we're producing is for the benefit of all. That's the beautiful part. So God sends all of this to both. All of these Christians in this congregation or this group that's listening to it, and he says some of them are receiving the same rain, but they're going to take it and turn it into something beautiful and useful for what God's purpose is for others. And then there's another group. You know, there's nothing about its usefulness. And that was the Judaizing teachers. That was the Gnostics that John had to deal with. They never would come to repentance because they felt so self-righteous and so self-secure. And what did they produce? They produced a different gospel. They produced something that was worthless and not what was needful for others around them. Now he brings it up. He lifts it up a little bit because it's pretty harsh so far. But jump into verse 9 with me. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire that each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those through faith and patience inherit promises. Even though I'm talking about this, and this is pretty heavy, and that there are some of that, and that's a real scare, 
Why would he talk about something that couldn't happen to them if they were already predestined, once saved, always saved? Why bring that up? It's confusing. It's confusing. Either I'm saved or I'm not. That's what they teach. Predestiny, Calvinism, Arminianism. You're either saved or you're not. God has already selected you or you have not been selected. So why discuss this? Because those, some of those people are reading, they're not saved anyway. And those who are, they don't need to worry about it. See? Doesn't make sense, does it? Because the danger is real. Okay, so because we talked about that, I have hope. It's not all gloom. Look, in your case, we know there are better things. I'm assured. Now, this is the Holy Spirit talking through the writer. So it's honest. It's not some placated type of platitude that you give somebody and say, I know your life is horrible, but it'll get better. If, I, if you hear that from me, I can't really guarantee it, can I? I can be hopeful. Don't worry, it'll get better. But when the Holy Spirit looks and he's pinning this letter to them, he knows their condition. But he wants them to be aware of the dangers. So that's what he says. Yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. And God's not going to overlook what you've accomplished and the way you're serving, the way you're loving. Because sometimes it becomes a distraction, doesn't it? When we see all the evil and things going on around us, we see Christians that eventually the briars come out in them. They come out. Now, I will never look at somebody who has fallen away as a Christian and say, Aha, Hebrews 6, ha ha, you're one of them. You're never going to repent. Don't ever do that. Don't. That's between them and God. That's what the Word of God can do that's so powerful. I can't. And I don't want to. But be aware. Just like casting pearls before swine. Be aware. But don't judge who's a pig, right? <laughs> oh, sorry, you're a pig. I'm not going to give you the Word of God. But just be aware. But the Holy Spirit knows that there's better for them. What has been going on for them. So my question is, what are you focused on? Are you focused on Jesus as a superiority of who he is, as the author has been explaining to us, and that we have this great high priest and the importance of us or of him for us today? I, I, again, I mean, I think it's a unique situation. I think that most, most Christians, you know, that's why he writes these, is to encourage us to continue on, but be aware, situationally aware, that these can happen to us spiritually also. And that it is happening. That's the other thing. It's not an if it happens. It's, it's happening. There are people like that. So if you're with us this morning, I hope that you will understand that the impossibility of repentance is really a unique situation. So this morning, if you're with us and where it can help you at all in your relationship with him, I hope that you will think about it. If you have not become a Christian, the way that the Bible teaches is initial submission, understanding that he is your Lord and Savior. But as the Apostle Peter said, repent and be baptized, each one of you, in order to receive forgiveness of sins. If there's anything that we can do to help you encourage your relationship as well, when we sing this invitation song, I hope that you will think about it. And if you're comfortable, come forward and let us know. If later on you would like prayers of the church, let us know as well. So think about these things while we stand and sing.